Will you try a, an experiment with me? I wish I had like a paper mache volcano and some baking soda or something. It's just a social experiment. I want you to think of your grandpa. Get your grandpa in your, in your head. Some of you are looking next to you and you're like, my grandpa's right here. Just put your grandpa's name, your mom's dad or your dad's dad, in your head right now. Think of their name. Put them right there. Think of them. You see them? Is your grandpa's name Jim? Mine is. Think of your grandpa's name, okay? You got him? You guys are like, come on. You haven't read scripture yet. You can't make us do stuff. Start. Help me. Think of your grandpa's name. Now I want you to think of your grandpa's dad's name, okay? So just go one more generation. That's your great-grandpa. You got him? Is his name John? Good. None of us are distant relatives or anything. It's good. My great-grandpa, his name is John. Now I want you to go up one more generation. Your your grandpa's father's father. Go up that that next tier. Go up the family tree to your grandpa's father's father. You got him? Is his name Ezra? We cheated a little bit so that I could remember that name by naming our son Ezra. You have it? That's the third tier. Are you there? Now, if you're like me, you don't want to go any further because you have no idea what the name of your grandpa's father's father, father's name is, right? Isn't it interesting when we do a little experiment like that? If you're normal, (laughs) like me, I'm not normal, but if you're at all average, you probably maybe don't even know your great-great-grandpa's name or what he did for a living. Uh, The chances are, within our culture, we don't know three or four generations beyond ourselves. And yet, within our culture, within this generation, so much emphasis is placed on this life, that we need to live this life to the best, we need to have the most fun, we need to invest all we have into the here and now, and yet, it is culturally normal to not even know three or four generations beyond us what they lived their lives for, what they did, how they lived, where they were from. We understand that life is short. That we are here, as Scripture says, the book of James reminds us in chapter 4, verse 14, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? The question is asked. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We've heard that passage of Scripture. We've heard messages about how short our life is, how it's over before we even know it, how our life on the span of eternity is just a little speck on that line. We've heard that story. We understand that maybe. We can grasp a little bit that our life is short. But what I think sometimes we overlook is what it is we're supposed to do during this short life we've been given. We've got some work to do. Uh, There's a, a band that I happen to think a lot about and uh, love a lot. It's the band uh, by the name of Switchfoot. Uh, They are a fantastic band. You should search them, look them, make them your favorite band. They're just incredible. They came out with a brand new song just this week that really uh, revolves around the same idea. The song literally came out this week, and it says, the the title of the song is Live It Well. Here's the lyrics. They're going to be on the screen for you. Follow along. It says this, life is short. I want to live it well. One life, one story to tell. Life is short. I want to live it well, and you're the one I'm living for. Awaken, oh my soul, every breath that you take is a miracle. Life is short. I want to live it well. I want to sing with all my heart a lifelong song. Even if some notes come out right and some come out wrong. I can't take none of that out the door. I'm living for more than just a funeral. I want to burn brighter than the dawn. I've got one life to live and one love. I've got one voice, and maybe that's enough. One heartbeat, two hands to give. I've got one shot, one life to live. It's good, isn't it? Don't you wish I wrote that? (laughs) As I was singing it all week long this week, that phrase just goes on and on and on in my heart. Life is short. I want to live it well. Do you remember the sneaker manufacturer, Reebok? How many of you had Reebok pumps? Come on. You had the basketball pump on the tongue of your shoe. Anybody going to admit to that? 
Okay, there's a couple people. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for being honest. Thank you, Tim, in the back. I'm so proud of you. I didn't have Reebok pumps. We were a poor pastor's family. So I had Voigt <laughs> pumps. They were like the knockoff version, and we would pump those shoes twice, and they would go psh. It was awful. But Reebok came out with this brand new shoe called the, the Reebok Pump, and they were so hyped on this, they came up with a, a, a brand new slogan to go with their promoting their brand, and it was this, life is short, play hard. Remember that? Isn't it interesting how the secular and the sacred both understand the truth that life is short? I mean, how many years are we going to live? Do we know? But we know in the grand scheme of things, if we don't even know our great, great, great grandpa's name or what he did, life is short. And the secular world says, play hard, work hard, do lots, enjoy this life. And the sacred scripture not only tells us that life is short, but reminds us that we have the will of our heavenly father to live out. And so the understanding this morning is that I I love this mantra, these lyrics from Switchfoot a lot better than the lyrics from Reebok, right? I want to live my life well knowing that life is short and I've got this one life to make an impact in eternity. It's why we do what we do, I hope. It's why we've gathered in this place is because we understand, even in some small way this morning, that life is short and that what I do in this life matters for eternity because if it didn't matter, we would just dig bunker shelters under our houses, right? Until after November. (laughs) If, If this life didn't matter, we would just arm ourselves to the teeth and just wait for the stuff to happen. Some of you are arming yourself to the teeth waiting for stuff to happen, right? It's okay. This life matters not because of the here and now, but because of the life everlasting. It shouldn't be a surprise that God's word today talks an awful lot about how short life is, but talks an awful lot about what we are to do with this life we have been given. This morning, I want to look at Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul gives this powerful scripture, this powerful command, these these exhortations to the church there in Ephesus of what it is their lives are to be if they are to live out the will of God well. And from this passage of scripture, I, I, I think I've found six things, six components of how we can live out God's will well in this life. Look here with me, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21. Paul, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, writes this letter to early Christians, and again, this passage of scripture, every passage of scripture is not just written to an original audience for them to hear. We have been given God's word, and it can impact us today. Verse 15, be careful, very careful then how you live. Again, talking to Christians. Be careful, very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, And songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Pray with me again. Lord, I pray that right now your Holy Spirit would use the words of this passage of Scripture to do a work in my heart and in any heart surrendered to you this morning. Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and open hearts to surrender again to your will. Life is short. Help us to live it well. Amen. So I find six components within these verses from this letter to the church at Ephesus that I think remind us of how it is we are supposed to 
practically live out God's will well in our life. And the first is this, to avoid excess. To avoid excess. It comes from the first part of verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. The New International Version, which I I use as my preaching Bible and often my study Bible, the NIV translation gives us this word debauchery, which is not a very good word in 2016 in our cultural context. We don't use it a lot. We We don't use that word in common conversation, so we have to dig a little bit deeper into understanding how this means, how this is defined for us. It can maybe be best defined for us this morning as excessive Living, excessive living, living it up, using up resources, valuable resources, and collecting them for ourselves. The root of the Greek word describes the same word that's used in the story of the prodigal son. Remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? That the Lord gives this illustration of the prodigal son who takes all of his father's inheritance that is owed to him when his father's gone, and he asks for it outright. Even while his father is still alive, which is a slam to his father. And he says, I want my inheritance now. And he goes and squanders it. He lives excessively. And what do we know from the story? He runs out of his funds. He's used up all of his resources and he comes back. It's a powerful story. A powerful reminder of what we are not to do. Excessive living. We've discussed the idea previously that our culture preaches to us often that more is better. That if our neighbor has something and we don't yet have it, what do we want? What our neighbor has. If Carnes Equipment Sales has something that I want and it's not tied up very well out front, you do read the paper. I'm not confessing anything because Kurt's in here but I may be building a new shed for a certain piece of equipment that showed up. I'm just kidding. Kurt knows I didn't steal it. He would have helped me. (laughs) Our culture preaches to us that we have to have more, get more, build more barns for more stuff, add on garages so that you can have more things, and more things is better. And yet scripture the entire time is saying, hey, 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 watch it. Watch out for the temptation of excessive living. Because what do we understand what happens when we live excessively? If we take things too far, the things of this world become more important than the king of this world. And most of us have experienced at some time or another that the things that we own often becomes the things that own us. I had a wonderful conversation this week with a with a man in our church who is living debt-free. So cool. Doesn't know anything on his house, nothing on his vehicles. Just living debt-free and working hard continually to give back in areas that matter to him and his family. And, and just having that conversation with him about the, the, the freedom that has come in their family's life. And they've been living debt-free since the 80s. Since before it was cool to try to be debt-free. They've been living in this way that allows them a freedom. He just testified so beautifully of what it looks like when when God makes something, uh, an opportunity fall, like today happened when we had an opportunity to give to a family in need, that their family can just say, yeah, let's do something. Let's make that happen. They have learned this point, this component of living God's will well, of avoiding the excess that our world says is necessary Jesus expressed to his disciples the danger within this idea to them in Luke chapter 12. He said, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about what you're, about your life, what you're going to eat or about your body, what you'll wear. Life is more than food, body more than clothes. Consider those ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barns, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Aren't you glad to be more valuable than birds, disciple of Jesus? Especially birds flying in someone's garage. Birds. Have you experienced freedom from the stuff? Have you experienced the freedom of of, of downsizing maybe as a family or letting go of some things personally? 
There's freedom involved in that, right? There's freedom of getting rid of the idols of this generation, of this life, and saying, I don't want this more than I want God. In each of these components, I want to ask you a question, and the question for you, on this component of excessive living, avoiding excess, is what, it is, what is it that is controlling you? What, what consumes your time, your resources, your, your energy? What is it that controls you? What is it that you can point to, maybe in your heart right now? Maybe right now you're trying to justify it in some way, but you know these things in your life are bigger to you than they should be. What is it in your life that controls you? Are you willing to come back into balance and remove whatever it is to live God's will well in this life to experience his presence and his directing voice in your life by getting rid of it, by removing the temptation. What is it that's controlling you? Avoid excess. The second component of living the will of God well for us in this life is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the second part of verse 18. Paul says, avoid excessive living. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. A quick look through a commentary reminded me that this, this word that gets used that says be filled in the original Greek, it does not describe a one-time filling of the Holy Spirit, but rather it is a ongoing process, a, a, a daily infilling of God's Spirit in the life of a Christian. This is one of the things that I love about us as a Wesleyan denomination is that we preach this idea, uh, that this theological truth that God wants to fill us anew, afresh, every single day, that our, our walk with him, our relationship, is a continual process. That he wants to fill us with his spirit every single day so that we can have direction in our life. So that he can point out those areas where we're living in excess. Paul is reminding early Christians that they have to get rid of the things of this world and instead fill themselves with God's Holy Spirit. We probably all have illustrations ourselves of getting rid of certain things, right? We, we, maybe maybe, we, maybe uh, during this time already this morning, we've already thought of something in our life that, yeah, that used to be, that used to be my thing. I used to, used to make sure I was up at dawn for all the yard sales because I was looking for those green-handled kitchen utensils. I don't know what it was for you. It wasn't that for me. <laughs> But now that stuff's all gone. I sold it all to the antique dealer and it's all gone. What is it that filled that space in your barns? What is it that you got rid of and then immediately, because it's our cultural norm, we filled it with the next thing, right? The hobby that consumed all of our time that we finally got rid of or our wife threw away, we found something else to fill it up with. And here in God's word, we're being reminded that we can't just fill our lives with more stuff to be satisfied. Instead, God wants to fill us with his spirit. The question for us, am I living a life of continual infilling of God's Holy Spirit? Am I living in request of more of him to fill me every single day? Or am I searching aimlessly through the Amazon pages, through the apps, through the stores, through the stuff of this life, looking for that next thing that will bring me this much fulfillment? God says, let me fill that void. Let me fill you every day. The third component of living out God's will for our life well is this, sing his songs over your life. Verse 19 says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Note there that there are three different variety of some kind of musical song uh, idea here. Psalms. 
The, the literal definition is understood of the, the striking of chords. And April's not in here anymore, so I could actually go take a hammer and hit the chords if I lifted that up and you'd understand what a psalm is. The striking of chords or the, the twanging, it's a, it's a sound involved as a song offered to God acknowledging all that he has done for you. As you read through the book of Psalms, you can acknowledge that each author of each psalm is acknowledging what God has done for them, how great he is, how marvelous his works, how he has saved them from the snares of the pit, of of the dangers of this life. We must sing these psalms. The second idea is hymns. Hymns are defined as the, the sacred. They declare the greatness of God. Even beyond our own experiences, a a, a hymn pushes back even further in history and just says, this is how great our God is. This is what he is capable of. This is who his nature truly is. We must have hymns sung over our lives. And the third is the songs from the Spirit. These spiritual songs, as it's described elsewhere in Scripture, are the songs of praise that are literally birthed out of God's Spirit in us. Songs of the Spirit that God's Spirit gives to us. Do you sing songs in your life? What what, what songs are played on repeat in your homes, in your car, in your head? Are these songs that give credence to who God is and what your life is about? Are they songs that give the enemy a foothold? Man, I sound like my parents, right? I only listened to it for the beat. Remember that lie? I told it just like you did. But what are the songs of your life? Are there more songs in your life that are tearing you down and elevating a a platform of sin and disgust in this world? Or are there more songs that reveal the nature of who God is and what he wants of you? I'm not advocating that you get rid of all your radio stations and make sure that 1 through 12 are all whatever the Christian radio station is in your neighborhood. I'm just asking the question for myself and for you. What are the songs that are being sung over your life? Do they reveal something difficult to grip? This isn't a reminder for you to change something. This isn't a a, a danger. I'm not trying to uh, challenge us to take singing lessons so that we can sing better songs. It's just a reminder that God wants to be experienced in our lives now. He wants us to experience his presence now. And we have opportunity. We have practical responses to experience more of him. I, I challenge you in this idea of singing song, his songs over your life to pray through the Psalms this week. Uh, Just open up your Bible. It's usually right there in the center that you'll find the book of Psalms. Not a hard book to find. Just read a psalm. Uh, Allow the psalms to become your prayer in the morning or in the evening. Allow the psalms to challenge your heart. Allow them to be your words as you pray them back to God. In this passage, Paul continues with the musical theme. In the second part of verse 19, he says, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. The fourth point is to make music in your heart. This this phrasing here is the understanding that we are literally to become the instrument of praise. We don't have to learn how to play the fiddle or a clarinet or anything like that. We literally, by by our being, become an instrument of praise used to celebrate his good works. What he is capable of doing our life becomes that response. Whether we're humming in the car, working in the garden, throwing darts, hitting golf balls, working at the assembly line, studying at school, our life literally becomes, as we make music in our heart, our life becomes a work of praise. That's 
what he asks us to do. That's what it looks like to live a life pleasing to the will of God. The point in this passage of scripture is that our our attention in our life now shouldn't be about our likes or dislikes of what worship music looks like for us. Rather, our focus should be on how our life, no matter what is going on in it, is singing audible, physical praises back to our Heavenly Father. So let me ask, is your heart making music for God or is your heart making music for someone, something else? Are you genuine in your praise as we sing exclamation points to our King of Kings and Lord of Lords or have you, like many of us, fallen into the trap of living out a a motion of worship instead of a devotion to worship. Would you be willing, would you be willing in your heart to clear the stage, to remove all the possible distractions and allow God to fill you in such a way that your life lives out a worthwhile praise? back to him. The fifth component of living God's will well is to give thanks always. Verse 20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Can we acknowledge that it's really easy to give God the praise and the honor and the adoration when we hit the home run on the church league softball team? Okay, that's never happened for me. It's easy to give God praise when things are going well, right? It's easy to to sing the praises of God when we win the lottery. Oh, God did this. He gave me those numbers. Again, that hasn't happened to me, nor has it happened to any of you, according to your tithing records. Some of you are going to get that a little bit later. I don't look at the, sorry. Bob's not here to scold me. It's easy, right? It's sometimes easy to reach out to God when we're in the low because we want to get uh, back to that elevated plateau or that peak moment where we know we've experienced him. But friends, can we admit that scripture reveals over and over again that God is worthy of our praise whether we are experiencing good interest rates on our 401k or we've lost it all in a house fire last night. God is still God. He's still worthy of that praise and he wants us to give thanks to him, to be praising him no matter what our circumstances are. And we can. You have reason right now, as you look around you, as you experience the moment right now, to be filled with praise. Do we know what's going to happen tomorrow? Do we know what's going to happen in just a few minutes when we're let out of here? But right now, we're breathing. Right now, you're on a comfortable chair. Right now, many of you are behind, beside, around friends and family and some enemies. Don't point. We have reason even in our lowest point, to give praise and honor back to God our Father. Here's your question. What are you taking for granted today and every day? What in your life has God done that you've allowed your gratefulness for to wear off, to wear thin, to go away, to get over? What is it in your life that you know God has done a magnificent thing, a miraculous thing that you haven't praised him for lately, give thanks always. The sixth component of living God's will well for us comes from verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to others, very simply. It asks us to acknowledge and to understand that God 
has intentionally given us, brothers and sisters in the church. That we have an opportunity to surround ourselves with those who will help us in those pit times. And those who will be with us there in those high times, those good moments of life where we can celebrate together and where we can sharpen one another. Let me put a plug again for Saturday's men's breakfast where we have a great time of fellowship and we wouldn't call it an accountability group, but let me tell you, if somebody was having a tough time, we would speak words of encouragement into their life. We've done that. Who is it in your life? that holds you accountable to the things of the word? Who is it in your life that is discipling you or who is it in your life that you are discipling and allowing to submit to you? If we're gonna live this life well, if if we're gonna make this life count for something in eternity, then let's learn to submit our lives to each other under the umbrella of of Jesus Christ, it is a necessary part of the Christian life. It's usually around times of losing a family member or a, a person in the community that we remember how short our life is, right? It's usually around that time of grieving the loss of someone that we spend a lot of time thinking about how short our life is. And asking the questions of, is this going to count for anything? Is this really all that there is? Uh, but I, I challenge you to think about it more often than that. And not just be a, a, a downer idea about our life being short. The world understands that. But instead of buying into the world's way of thinking, hey, life's short, play hard, do all you can, have fun. I want to add to that. Live it well. Life is short. I want to live it well, don't you? Learning to submit to the will of our Heavenly Father is an ongoing process. I don't know if any of us in this room would admit to having it all together. But we can join in this process that God is already doing by living surrendered lives and learning to avoid excess to say, I want less of me, I want more of him. To secondly, be filled with his Holy Spirit every day. Fill those voids of losing on the things of this world with more of him. To number three, sing his songs over our lives. Praise him with thankfulness. To number four, make music in our hearts to become the literal instrument of praise that he created you to be. Fifthly, to give thanks always. We need to understand that thankfulness is the foundation of our relationship with him. We have much to be thankful for. And again, sixth, to submit to others. To be accountable to others within the family of Christ. To help ensure a surrendered life. If you don't have someone in your life pointing out the possible red flags in even some of these areas, You need to surround yourself with that opportunity. You need to get plugged in, please. Seek after it. Find someone else to hold you accountable. It's a tall order, isn't it? To work on all these areas of our lives, to live life well. If this one to six verses of scripture is supposed to uh, be a prescription for us today of, uh, of going out from this place and finally getting it together, let me tell you, there's not just six things. There's a whole book of God's word of things we need to be doing. These are just the starting point. If that's overwhelming to you, welcome to the club. Instead of being overwhelmed at the impossibility, right? That's what we think. I'll never be able to do that like so-and-so did it. I'll never be able to get to that point like my great-great-grandpa Ezra did. I'll never be able to do what Saint so-and-so does or did within the church. This morning as we close in prayer, maybe ask God to point out one of these areas in your life. Uh, Maybe during this message you felt a little twinge of something that you quickly tried to distract yourself. 
because you didn't want to feel the conviction of something being wrong in the way you're living your life for the Lord. If that's the case, ask God to bring that back up in these moments of closing. And ask him to do a work inside of you to change you, to challenge your heart. Life is short. No doubt about it. I want to live it well. Would you stand with me as we close? Let's bow our heads together. Lord Jesus, I pray that you are at work in even just one heart, one life this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict an area in a heart or in a life today that would be the starting point of even more miraculous transformation in our midst. We believe corporately, Lord, that you are at work, ongoing work in our hearts and lives. And in the closing moments of our time together here this morning, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would convict and do the work that only you can do. We acknowledge the brevity, the shortness, the quick life we are living. And Lord, I pray that we would not give in to society's message of gain more, do more, but instead we would focus our life's work our families, our individual time and effort, everything we are to being about your cause, your kingdom. We believe it's possible. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. Convict our hearts. As we leave this place today, change us, challenge us. Point out areas in our lives that, that we believe you are asking us to transition in, to transform in. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity that has been ours to gather in this place. Go with us now as we depart. Transform our hearts and lives, we pray, through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you. As you go through this week, experience his presence. Amen.